Good morning. Welcome to worship, beloved. Those of you who are able to be in the room with us this morning and those of you who are in the room with us virtually, it's good to be together. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As we come together, I'd just like to offer a few announcements. Uh, we are continuing to look for ways to, to experience worship safely and with some convenience. So those of you who are in the room, let me uh, remind you to make sure your phones are turned off uh, and that when we sing in the room, we'll be remaining seated. Uh, and when we sing at home, I hope you'll stand and give voice to that. A couple of announcements. We continue with our uh, fall worship schedule, which means that worship is at 11. We had an adult faith builders class at 9.30 this morning. That will continue for the next two weeks. Uh, also, that same content is offered on Wednesdays at 7.30 via Zoom. This month, we are looking at the Book of Order at the Presbyterian Church calls us to evaluate the, the, the practice of our own membership. What does it mean for us to be connected to a local congregation? I hope and trust that uh, all the members of the church have seen this in their church newsletter, The Runner. Thank you to those of you who have taken the time to respond already. Let me invite everybody to please look for that or send an email to the church uh, and we'll get talk, uh, give you a, a link to that page. We continue to work for some options for children's faith builders and my understanding is that that is still in the works. We don't have anything to announce yet. Am I right about that? Correct. Okay. Uh, one more time, I want to welcome our friends at McKeesport Presbyterian Church. McKeesport Church experiencing a pastoral transition and in that time they are gathering with us virtually in this room. Saints of McKeesport, welcome to Crafton Heights. You crossed a river, and we're glad that you did. As we're here today, uh, if you're in the room or if you're paying attention online, there's a blood drive that goes until 1 o'clock. You can go downstairs and offer blood. Uh, and the last thing that I would point out by way of announcements is that the last couple weeks I've talked about the All Church Retreat, looking for feedback. We will not be having an all-church retreat in November of this year. Uh, working in conjunction with our friends at Crestfield, we decide that the pandemic is just making too much of that difficult. So look for a possibility of one in the spring, and we'll let you know about that. Having said all of that, I would invite those of you into the room to stand as Erlina May leads us in our call to worship. Please join me in the call to worship. The foolish say, there is no God. We are alone, on our own. We gather to declare the glory of God in our lives. The foolish say, it is your life. You are accountable to no one. We gather strengthened by the Spirit, trusting that Christ dwells in our hearts. The foolish say, everything I have is mine. I owe nothing to anyone. We gather to praise the one who calls us to serve others in love.
Please join me in the prayer of confession in unison, including a time of silent confession. You have given us a world of beauty, and we have spoiled it. A world to feed us, and so many go hungry. A world of riches, and we are unwilling to share. A world to care for, and we think only of ourselves. Forgive us, gracious God. Every time your heart is saddened by our selfishness, every time we have no thought for others, no cares but ours. And continuing, saying, Enable us to see this world as a gift from you that can be shared, and all who live on it as our neighbors. We ask this, that your name may be glorified through the beauty of this world and the service of our lives. Amen. The assurance of pardon. In the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, we are assured that there is no sin so terrible that God cannot forgive. No hurt so terrible that God cannot heal. God accepts, God forgives, and God sets free. Receive the forgiving love of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. O oh God, the three in one, you draw us into your community of love with people across the ages and around the world. By the same spirit that binds us together, speak to us that what we read and ponder may enliven us and stretch us to trust and follow you. Through Christ our Savior. Amen. The first scripture reading today comes to us from James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted, and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you, and it will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure for the last days. Listen, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous one who does not resist you. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, friends. It's time for the children's message, and I have some friends in the room. I'm glad to see developments here today and Cam. It's good to be together, and I'm especially also glad that my friend Mr. Tim is in the room today, because I want to talk about something very kind that Mr. Tim Propelka did for me a couple of years ago, probably eight or nine years ago. 
Mr. Propelka came to my came to church and he gave me a handful of beans. Little white beans. And he said, I know you like to garden. You talk about your garden a lot. And you know that I do. And he said, if you grow these, these will be delicious beans. People in my family have grown these beans. Tim told me for 50 years those beans had been growing. That's how I'm remembering it, and I have the mic, so that's how it is. So I've been growing beans. Look at this. Can you see this at home? And I know in a room you can. This is a whole bag of beans. I love beans. I've been picking beans all summer long. We've been having bean quiche. We've been having beans and corn. We've had beans with fish and beans with rice. We've been eating a lot of beans with dip and hummus. A lot of beans, but even still, I have more. And so the other day, I went into my kitchen and I cut up some beans and I put them in bags and I put them in the freezer. And I've been doing that all summer. Except something happened yesterday. I went to put beans in the freezer and something fell out and landed on my foot. And you know what it was? Beans. It was a bag of beans. And I looked at the bag of beans and you know what it said? 2017. 2017, I have beans from three years ago. So I looked in my freezer. I also have beans from 2018 in my freezer. I didn't grow beans last year. That was a breather for me. Now I have beans from 2020, and I picked all of these beans today, yesterday. This many beans yesterday. I have too many beans. The fact that I have beans in my freezer from three years ago means that I'm growing more beans than Sharon and I can eat. And that's a problem. And I thought it would not be right for me to put these beans in my freezer when I already have three-year-old beans in there. The Bible passage that Miss Erlina just read to us talks about people who have more than they need. They have more than they can use. They have more clothes than they can wear, more food than they can eat, more money than they can spend. And Jesus invites us when we find ourselves in that situation. What's the thing that we do? When we have more than we need, what do we do? We share. Thank you. We share. So this is a public announcement to those of you who are in the room today. I am not taking any of these beans home. There are some baggies down in the kitchen. If you want beans, take these home because I'm not putting another bean in my freezer today. I have enough beans. I hope you have enough of the things that are important to you. And where you have more than you need, I hope you'll find a way to share. I'm glad we can be together. Thanks for being in the room today. Thanks for watching us on the screen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you are giving to us so many things. We thank you for the privilege of this time together. And we ask that you would help us to learn more and more what it means to share beans and money and the other important things of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Old Testament reading comes from the book of Proverbs, the 31st chapter, verses 1 through 9. The words of King Lemuel, an oracle that his mother taught him. No, my son, no, son of my womb, no, son of my vows. Do not give your strength to women, your ways to those who destroy kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink, or else they will drink and forget what has been decreed and will pervert the rights of the afflicted. 
Give strong drink to one who is perishing, and wine to those in bitter distress. Let them drink and forget their poverty, and remember their misery no more. Speak out for those who cannot speak, for the rights of all the destitute. Speak out, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I preached my first sermon when I was 16 years old. I've been an ordained pastor for 30 years now. And today I'm breaking new ground in preaching from Proverbs chapter 31. I have never been here before. Now there are a number of reasons for that, but to be honest, the truth is, I'm not really crazy about the book of Proverbs. In some ways, to me, Proverbs is kind of like the fortune cookie book of the Bible. There are a lot of wise sayings, an alarming number of which pertain to avoiding loose women and strong drink. Most of the book is attributed to a man who is the very personification of wisdom, King Solomon of Jerusalem. But my main reaction to Proverbs has been, well, meh. And I surely was not planning on preaching Proverbs in conjunction with this series of sermons on the letter of James. But I came across this passage that Mike just shared with you from the last chapter in the book. And I was captivated. You heard it. We're told that these are the words of King Lemuel. All right, sounds good to me. I, I, I don't know who King Lemuel was, but it sounds like a pretty good Bible-y name, doesn't it? You got, you got Ahaz, Hezekiah, Rehoboam, Solomon. Why not Lemuel? It seems to fit. Except that neither Israel nor Judah ever had a king named Lemuel. Now there's some evidence that an Arabian people called the Massah were led by someone named Lemuel, but the Massah were descendants of Ishmael, which meant that by Old Testament standards anyway, they didn't play for our team. And we're not really sure who Lemuel is, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because the text that we have was written by him, it says, not by Lemuel, but by his mother, a woman whose name has been lost to history. All right, well, well, why does that matter? Well, because it was very rare for a woman to have an authoritative verse in the culture in which the book of Proverbs was compiled. But here, this unnamed woman gets essentially a byline. Now, there was one exception to the women should be seen and not heard policy, and that was when a queen mother was given a voice during a period of transition or disruption. For instance, if the reigning king were to die and his son, the child, was not quite old enough to rule, then the child's mother would be granted permission to help inform policy as that child aged. Examples of this in several Middle Eastern cultures, particularly Egyptian, from this time period. The queen mother was expected, invited, to make some comments of a didactic nature. And then that became a formal charge to the young king. And, and here's something else. Proverbs 31, 1 to 9 are the only commands, the only teachings in this book to be directed to the leader of the people. Everything else in the book of Proverbs is allegedly from the leader to the people. But this is a charge to the powerful king. So here's the deal. When the people of God, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, started sorting out what was scripture and what wasn't, Somebody went to great lengths to ensure that this wisdom from a woman who was outside the community in several ways 
that that wisdom got incorporated into the Bible and was passed down as a word from God. Now see, that's saying something. It's more than a little surprising to hear Lemuel's mother's voice as the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. But here we are, listening to it. But what does it say? You heard it. Essentially, this charge from Lemuel's mother indicates that those who have more power, authority, and resources than others are charged to yield that privilege to those who possess less power, authority, or wealth. But there's more. There's a sense that Lemuel's mother is charging him to make sure that nothing so clouds his judgment that he forgets who he is or what he's supposed to be doing. If people who are in positions of power, authority, and privilege lose sight of their call to be godly, then bad things are going to happen. Injustice will emerge. Pain and misery will prevail. The role of those with great privilege, according to the scripture, is to stand in solidarity with those who are at risk, to amplify the voice of the marginalized, and to attend to those who suffer by addressing the causes of their suffering. And it's important again for us to remember, I feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but we have to remember that all of this advice is coming from an unlikely source, a woman who under normal circumstances would not be heard. A woman at whom people would nod and smile perhaps but to whom they would not listen. However, because there is a season of change, and for her, a season of loss and grief and tumult, this woman's voice is heard, her wisdom is recognized and recorded, and her warnings are shared. The oracle that King Lemuel's mother taught him was born in what we might call a liminal season. A time between that which had been previously known, the old king was alive, hale and hearty, ruling on a throne, and that which was still to come. This boy king is not quite ready to rule. The Latin word limen means threshold, that strip of wood that is between the outside and the inside, or one room and another. Liminality implies a crossing over. If we were to say that someone was experiencing a liminal season, we would be implying that they had left something behind and yet had not fully arrived at the new place. You all know something about liminal seasons. And one of the things you know is that hardly anybody likes them. That feeling of liminality is exhausting, it's frustrating, it's chaotic, and yet it is often the space where we, it is easiest for us to recognize and to participate in the work of the holy. And as we continue to read through the book of James, we acknowledge that this book, James, just like the book of Proverbs, belongs to the wisdom tradition of literature. It is a voice also that comes from a liminal space. This is what I mean. The first followers of Jesus, well, they thought that because Jesus was Jewish, that they would be Jewish too. But as time went by, the leaders within the Jewish community looked at these Christ followers and they said essentially, not so fast, you don't. The early Christians, as we've heard in previous weeks, began to experience persecution and oppression from both religious and governmental authorities. James is writing to help them make sense of this persecution and to follow in the Jesus way in a time of uncertainty and change and liminality. So far in this letter, he has offered words of encouragement and compassion and tenderness. He's issued teachings about responsibility and godly conduct, as well as a call to humility and the avoidance of arrogance. James challenges his readers' selfishness and pride. And in today's reading, the author of this letter launches into a blistering condemnation of people who claim that they're following Jesus but whose conduct reveals an ignorance of the things of which Lemuel's mother taught, 
and that Jesus taught. He describes a reality in which some people have far more than they could ever use. Literally piles of clothes that are rotting away. Precious metals that are gathering dust and tarnish. And a general picture of a people who dwell in superlative abundance and ignorance and selfish bliss. And so verse 4 begins with an exclamation, listen, he says. There's a warning for God's people to pay attention to the cries for justice that, in which they are surrounded and to take advantage of the liminal season in which they live as an opportunity to create new patterns of faithful living. James echoes the words of Proverbs as he pleads for justice for the workers and freedom for the oppressed. He calls his sisters and his brothers to recognize their positions of privilege and to yield that privilege for the sake of the larger community. And perhaps this is one of the scriptures that Pope John Paul II was thinking about when he wrote that the goal of the Christian is not to have a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of many people, both near and far, but rather a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good, that is to say the good of all and of each individual, because we really are responsible for all. He's not wrong. And that, beloved, brings me to today. This week, I was privileged to spend some time with a young person who was trying to process the train wreck that is the year of our Lord 2020. And this student moaned, why does saying black lives matter have to be a political statement? Shouldn't that just be obvious to everybody? Had my young friend possessed more patience and energy for an astounding burst of Pastor Dave wisdom, I would have explained that it is a very political statement because politics is simply the way that people who live in groups make decisions. Politics is all about coming to an agreement about the way that we will choose to live in our tribe or our city or our country. So Black Lives Matter is a political statement. And if I was granted even more time and energy with this frustrated young person, I've gone on, I would have gone on to say that even though BLM, Black Lives Matter, or Blue Lives Matter, or Baby Lives Matter, are political statements. They need not be partisan statements. As a body politic, we need to recognize the worth and value of each life. And yet, in this liminal season that is the great pandemic of 2020, it has become apparent that too many people, particularly people who have been invested with authority and power, have been living as if black lives matter less than brown lives or, or non-black lives. Black lives matter less than non-black lives. In too many places, black and brown life is cheap. It's not considered to be as consequential as white life. And that, my friends, is an abomination to the creator of all life to the author of each life. This season of pandemic, tension, unrest, and dis-ease has opened for many of us who are not black and brown some glimpses into the struggles of those who are. We have seen grave injustice and great violence in ways that are often horrifying. And some of what we have seen and sensed has provoked even greater unrest, disorder, disunity, and pain. Friends, this is a liminal season. Nobody wants to be where we are right now. We want to move. 
We want to get out of this place. But how? Where are we going to go? The temptation to which many of my friends have given voice is simple. Take me back. Can't we just go back to the good old days? Let's return to law and order, common decency, respect. Let's go back there. Many of the people that I love dearly believe that our call is to return our nation, our culture, our police, our politics to some former glory some former identity. And when I ask them, okay, how far back should we go? To the days when women were prohibited from voting? To the years when entire communities were redlined, making it impossible for people of color to purchase their own homes? To the era of Jim Crow, where non-whites were expected to know their place? Or to the time, which happens to be today, when 30 states in the United States of America have no law against involuntary conversion therapy, a horrific attempt to use pseudoscientific practices to change a person's gender identity or sexual orientation. How far back are we going to go? If I ask the question that way, I almost always receive from my friend a look of shock and panic, and they almost always say, no, geez, Dave, no, that's not what I'm saying. But it's just so hard now. Everything is up for grabs. It's it's hard. I have to think through and decide about everything. It's new. I just want it to be normal. I'm worn out, Dave. I'm exhausted. Yes. Yes, you are. And so am I. And so are the women and the people of color and the LGBTQ people whom God loves. It's not right. It's not fair. It's not just to expect that my neighbor will want to retreat to my normal simply because I had grown comfortable with my neighbor's oppression or dis-ease. The call of the gospel is to enter into this liminal space and to allow the new thing that Christ is doing to unfold and to participate in that new thing to the end that the love and peace and grace and justice and mercy of Jesus will extend more deeply into the lives of the people with whom I share this life and this planet. Spiritual director and author Richard Rohr puts it this way. He writes, to get out of this unending cycle, we have to allow ourselves to be drawn into sacred space, into liminality. All transformation takes place here. We have to allow ourselves to be drawn out of business as usual and remain patiently on the threshold where we are betwixt and between the familiar and the completely unknown. There alone is our old world left behind while we are not yet sure of the new existence. It is the realm where God can best get at us because our false certitudes are finally out of the way. This is the sacred space where the old world is able to fall apart and a bigger world is revealed. If we don't encounter liminal space in our lives, we start idealizing normalcy. The threshold is God's waiting room. Here we are taught openness and patience as we come to anticipate an appointment with the divine doctor. Some native peoples call liminal space crazy time. I believe that the unique and necessary function of religion is to lead us into this crazy liminal time. But instead, religion has become largely a confirmation of the status quo and business as usual. Religion should lead us into sacred space where deconstruction of the old normal can occur. Much of my criticism of religion comes about when I see it not only affirming the system of normalcy, 
but teaching people how to live there comfortably. Cheap religion teaches us how to live contentedly in a sick world. Beloved, this has nothing to do with partisanship, and yet it has everything to do with politics, the ways that we decide we are going to live together. So can we choose to follow the gospel and to learn to listen and to learn and to act in love? Can we agree that we are going to treasure the lives that have been too often devalued? Can we work to construct a society wherein the intentions of the Creator are evident in the ways that we treat each other and the rest of the creation? Thanks be to God who is merciful and just even as we struggle to find meaning in these confusing and liminal times. Amen. And thank you to the worship team for helping us learn that important new song. We have the great privilege and the responsibility to come together now and to share those things that have been a part of our joys and our sorrows uh, in this past week. Um, I learned last week, uh, actually during worship, I got a text that uh, my mother's oldest sister, my Aunt Doris, passed away at the age of 90. Uh, she outlived my mother by 30 years and uh, we are grateful for her life and that her struggle is gone. I invite you to continue to pray for Debbie Beatty who is Janet Sebracia's sister. 
Uh, Debbie uh, continues at Shadyside Hospital in her treatment for leukemia. I invite you to pray with and for the Crafton Heights Community Preschool. We have been in prayer, and many of you have been intimately acquainted with the ways that schools and teachers and districts have had to change in this pandemic. You should know, as members of this community, that our Crafton Heights Community Preschool has made the very difficult and painful decision to close its doors uh, for at least the fall semester as we try to find ways to be together safely and soundly. So pray for Sherry and for the rest of that team. I invite you to continue to pray for Terry Blachek, who is recovering well. Uh, from some surgery she had to address injuries she received several years ago. I would celebrate a joy. Yesterday I was a part of a Zoom meeting that uh, involved about uh, 15 people, folks here in Pittsburgh, folks in Malawi, including our dear friend David Langesi uh, and uh, Billy Gama, uh, as well as uh, Philip Akwe Obang in South Sudan. And we talked about the ways that churches around the world are responding. And one of the things I learned, which was greatly encouraging to me, as I hope it will be to you, and that is that the nation of Malawi has suffered no COVID-related deaths in the past week across the entire nation. Billy said uh, that they were allowed to gather together initially in groups of 10 for no more than one hour for church. And one of my American friends said, yeah, that sounds about like how we're doing it. 10 people in a room for an hour. But they are increasing in their ability to worship, and we hope that we will as well. I also would share a joy that the youth group is starting up again. Next Sunday evening, youth group will gather. Uh, if you have a child in your family who is of youth group age, you should have gotten a letter, but reach out to Mike or to me if that's not the case. I find that to be important because there was a study released on Saturday morning indicating that thoughts of depression and self-harm had gone up multiplicatively in the lives of our children and young people because they are not able to access relationships with trusted adults in the same way. So we're going to try youth group, and we need your prayers. Women's group is also going to meet. They are a group of trusted adults. Uh, there's information in the bulletin, and Danny, that group will meet in person, downstairs, at 10 o'clock on Tuesdays. So in Fellowship Hall, we'll need to follow our protocol, which means wear a mask, wash your hands, and be nice to each other as we come together for the women's group on Tuesday mornings. Are there other prayer joys or concerns that uh, those of you in the room would lift up? I'll invite those of you at home to go ahead and type them on the screen. Tim. Look at Tim, no pins in his hand. He's using that well. You want some bean seeds to plant in your garden, Tim? <laughs> Other things today. Let's continue. Lord, we give you thanks for the ways that you have been present with us and for us. Thank you for the privilege of gathering together in whatever space has seemed right and appropriate and available to us today. For the gift of technology, which so far has not failed us. For the gift of community, which has never let us down. For your promise of love, which sustains us. We pray in particular that you would guide us and guard us as we seek to live in this time of liminality. We are like those tightrope uh, those acrobats, we've let go of what we were holding on to and we're getting ready to grab onto something new. But right now, we're just sort of flying. Help us to hold on to the fact that we are always in your care. We pray for those in our nation who are experiencing discomfort, dis-ease, unrest. We ask, Lord, that justice would come to reign. We pray that life would matter in a more significant and deeper sense than we have ever known it to matter in this country. We pray for those who are held hostage to something of the past, to a memory that has enslaved them, to a practice 
that has held them down to a culture that has devalued them. We pray liberation might come in ways that bring life and hope and reflect your intentions for the world. Protect us from the arrogance that would lead some of us to believe that we already had it and all we need to do is go back to trying that a little bit harder. Help us to grow in ways that can be uncomfortable. We pray for those who are charged with leading this nation and ask that you would develop within them and us a character of justice, the quality of integrity, the presence of peace, the ability to live in love. Be with your church in these difficult and liminal days and help us to be faithful in our administration of those tasks with which you have charged us. May we be attentive to your word and active in your work. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Using the words that he has given us by praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There are many signs we claim for our faith, but ultimately it is our active love that reveals who we worship. As we give a portion of our finances, let us commit to give the whole of ourselves. I invite you to give of your talents and material possessions to the church with the expectation that they will be used to further God's dream for our world. Please commit yourself and give as you're able. For those of you in the room this morning, please note that there are plates in the rear of the sanctuary in which to place your gifts. Those of you online will see instructions on your screen. Let us pray. God of salvation, we seek to be children of your heavenly kingdom. Yet our self-deceiving ways cause us to believe that we will be more generous givers once we have satisfied our own personal material desires. Change our thinking. Help us to be faithful disciples who recognize that everything we have in life is a gift from you. Inspire us to share our resources as a response to your unconditional love. Amen.
now, beloved, go out into the world in peace and have courage. Hold on to what is good and return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help the suffering and honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. And let the whole church say, Amen. Amen.